Uh, thank you. I, I don't know what to say to that. That's very thoughtful. So yes, I was one of the founding members of London CD, but I don't come as often now as I'd like to. I have uh, two young children. I have a business. I'm writing a book. And it's just very hard to find time to do anything. Uh, I am still very much involved in Pipeline. I spend a lot of time thinking about Pipeline. Uh, but uh, what I really do is I think a lot about continuous delivery. I have the fortune to know Dave Farley and Jess very well. And um, uh, so the book I'm writing now, and I'm already breaking my own rule. Uh, so already at the start I was like, I'm going to spend 35 minutes, I'm going to be in and out, I'm going to do exactly what I'm going to do in a few weeks' time at a conference. And already I've just tossed that out that one, just rambling away. <laughs> don't know what I'm doing, got no clue, didn't even know where this is going. Uh, <laughs> what was he going to say? I don't know. So I was going to tell a about Jez, then I thought, should I tell that? And I was like, oh, I might as well. So um, uh, I spoke at Lineage of Scotland last September, and uh, Jez flew in to give a keynote, and I was kind of lying in wait like I do for Jez. I was like, going to land and I'm going to ask him stuff because getting a hold of him online is impossible. And uh, he'll never watch this because Jez is too busy to watch videos of me so I can say whatever I like about him or Dave. It just, he won't watch this. Uh, don't tell him though. Uh, so no, so I was kind of lying in wait and then he turned up late at night jet lagged as he always is. And then he kind of ran off to bed. And then the following day I lay in wait for him again. And I cornered him. But he was kind enough. I didn't corner him. He was kind enough to give me uh, an hour of his time. And I showed him some of the stuff I've been doing at uh, a major client for the last couple of years. And I talked about how I'd taken on his uh, state of DevOps reports, you might, which you might be familiar with, and his re uh, peer-reviewed research into continuous delivery. And then I showed him a big spreadsheet that I have uh, that I'm Matthew knows me working on for a couple of years. And I showed him my spreadsheet, and he was like, and I was like, I've, I've got this data for like 60 teams. What do you think? And he was like, I, I have it for one team, Steve. You've got 60. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. But now he started a business devoted to like, researching and studying continuous delivery, so I need to speed up again. Uh, I have a cost of delay. Um, so uh, anyway, he won't watch that. <laughs> OK. Uh, so um, uh, I don't know what Dave's doing. Dave's, in, Dave's abroad at the moment. He, I'm, I'm safe. So yes, uh, I'm Steve Smith. Uh, I'm here to talk about uh, measuring continuous delivery. So I'd like to thank Matthew for having me on very short notice. Uh, I am uh, doing a keynote in a couple of weeks about continuous delivery and I was planning on talking about this this summer when I finished my book, but I, again I estimated the high cost of delay and have dragged everything forward quite severely. So for the past couple of weeks at home I've done nothing but work on this talk. So uh, continuous delivery is immensely valuable. It's really good that I don't have to do that talk anymore. Uh, but continuous delivery is extremely difficult. Uh, I have several criticisms of David Jazz's book. One is that it does underplay how hard this thing is. So I'm going to pick up on one of the things that uh, Hibri talked about. Hibri talked about how do you know what to fix first? And then he gave the right answer, which really confused me. He asked a question, had the answer, which is like the perfect consultant thing to do. Uh, the correct answer is you should start with monitoring. That is always the thing to start with first, unless you have an extraordinarily high cost of delay. Like if, uh, in, in you, if you're in Paul's case, our generous host tonight, Paul, is running a bank, you have a banking license, there is a cost of delay because other banks out there right now are trying to do the same thing as him. Maybe in his case he might leave the monitoring a little while. But for everyone else, you should start with monitoring. But I want to talk about the thing that's kind of missing in the continuous delivery book and then hinted at in the Lean Enterprise book. You should be measuring stuff. You shouldn't just be sat there going, I know trunk-based development is the right thing to do, or I know that getting devs to do on-call is the right thing to do, uh, because I've been that person. Uh, uh, I won't uh, repeat the word that Hibri used earlier, the B word, because I'm teaching myself not to swear on video, uh, but I've been that person that says, like, we're going to do this, and then after a year you wonder why people have stopped listening to you. It's because you're just getting compliance, you're not getting commitment. And I think a really good way to get commitment is to actually measure stuff. I've rambled for so long, I don't know where this is going. Uh, right, I'm actually going to do my talk now. So, um, before we start, uh, and we know Hibri's answer already, so Hibri doesn't have to put his hand up. How many people here are actually measuring the stability and speed of their release process right now? Okay, right, so there's three of, four of us going to be friends. Okay, the rest of you do it tomorrow, okay? Because there's a gold mine of information out there waiting for you, right? Uh, okay, so I'm a continuous delivery consultant and trainer. I do uh, training courses. I do uh, long-term consultant uh, gigs where I take on like the con kind of continuous delivery consultant role that Hibri spoke about earlier. Uh, I'm also writing a book at the moment called Measuring Continuous Delivery. It's on Lean Pub, and 
Uh, it's all about this talk, but in much more detail, kind of the what, the how, the where, the when, the why of measuring continuous delivery. And I co-authored a book with Matthew a couple of years ago on uh, like an anthology of continuous delivery stories. And actually in that, I told the hilarious tale of how I spent three years doing continuous delivery at a company without really measuring stuff, and then finding out after three years I'd not fixed the constraint at all. It had been in a completely different place to where I'd been looking. That was good to learn. So, uh, it was for three years. Anyway, so uh, continuous delivery is a good thing because there's an opportunity cost associated with not delivering something on time. So originally the continuous delivery book talked about reducing cycle time, which is a phrase I avoid like the plague. Uh, I would say that continuous delivery is about improving the stability and speed of IT delivery. And it's important to mention both of those things. It's not just about speed. Uh, I would say uh, you're in a state of continuous delivery when the stability and speed of your release process satisfy business demand. If you don't have that, then you are in a state of discontinuous delivery, which is a thing I coined by looking in dictionary.com for antonyms of continuous. Uh, but it's a thing now, I've made it a thing. I want everyone to tweet that. So, uh, yeah, so when an organization successfully adopts continuous delivery, which I've personally experienced in the past, it is a wonderful thing because you can trial product ideas and search for new revenue streams much faster than your competitors. And that's a real business advantage. But as Dave and Jess kind of hinted at in the original book, it's very difficult because there's an awful lot of things to do. And obviously the book was published seven years ago. That list of things to do has only grown over the last seven years. So here is a list of the uh, technology improvements that are mentioned in the book and I've kind of also added on to at my kitchen table a couple of nights ago. Uh, this is a very long list. I'm not going to waste your time by going over all of them because you will know most of them. Uh, yes, you need continuous integration. You need version control. You need canary deployments. You need smoke tests. <coughs> this is, all of these things are very hard to do. They're very valuable. They're very rewarding. They're very challenging. And after that, or before that, I don't know yet, uh, there's a long list of organisational changes to make which are much more time consuming and much more challenging and much more valuable than the technology stuff. Getting everyone to do on call is uh, going to give you a lot of explicit and implicit benefits, for example. But as Hibri was saying, which one of these do you do first? Uh, there is no right answer. The heuristic of do monitoring first is a good one, but it's not always the right answer. Anyone who prances around London saying, I know what you should do first is wrong. Uh, and that's because it's the technology changes, it's the organizational changes, it's the constraints and circumstances of your organization together that make continuous delivery so difficult. It's those things together that you need to understand. And, uh, the way to figure it out, the way to understand what you should be doing is to measure your continuous delivery adoption and uh, get insights into what you should be doing next and if the thing you're doing is actually taking you in the direction that you want to go. Uh, the original continuous delivery book mentioned a maturity model and there's someone here amongst us, a very nice man, who once had me to do a training course and he had the idea of us doing a maturity model together to uh, frame the training course, which was a really good idea because it, uh, in the context of like a one or two day uh, engagement, it's a really good way to start up conversations. But in the long term, I don't think a maturity model is good enough. It's like a checklist of practices. It's something that's very subjective, it's prone to bias, and it's only ever a one-off measure because it's something that's expensive to do, right? Someone has to sit down and actually uh, do stuff. So I know that uh, Matthew once on an engagement actually was like faithfully printing out the checklist of practices from Dave and Jez's book and was like ticking them off as he did them. And I remember reading that thinking, wow, that must have taken an awful lot of time to do. I don't want to do that. It'd be nice to automate that, wouldn't it? So, uh, how can we actually uh, automate that kind of stuff? So, uh, I have lots of stories about measuring continuous delivery, uh, and this one is the best. So, for the past uh, two and a half, three years, I've worked um, within government, in a major government department. I won't say who it is, uh, but it, they're all much for muchness, I think, in some ways. Uh, I have been an operations team lead in quite an unusual team. Uh, the team is responsible for delivery consulting and the release engineering tool chain and we service 60 teams. So anyone who mentions the word I hate scale uh, doesn't get much uh, traction with me. You know, people phone me and say, hey, I've got 15 teams in a bank. 
but you can't do continuous delivery. And I'm like, well, I've got 60 teams and they seem to be doing okay. Um, in government, which is harder in some ways, easier in others. So these 60 teams are working on a, about 100 digital services that all of us use as citizens every day in our lives. Um, and they are all composed of multiple microservices running on a PaaS. So when my team started out, we didn't know an awful lot. Uh, <coughs> we knew that every team had the same technology value stream between version control and production. Uh, exploratory testing happened locally. Automated acceptance tests ran on the build environment. There was an optional integration test environment. Uh, I did a talk last year talking about how awful end-to-end -end testing is. One of the first things I did in government was to ensure that end-to-end -end testing was optional. I was so happy when someone <coughs> said yes to that. It was wonderful. I made them write a note about it. It was wicked. Um, there was also a mandatory performance testing environment and then we went into lovely, lovely production uh, where all the magic happens and we save citizens money in their taxes. <sighs> okay, so we wanted to evangelize continuous delivery to our 60 teams, but we didn't actually know how long teams were taking to deploy to production. Some of the teams sat next to me in London seemed to be going awfully fast, but there were teams around the country that we didn't know anything about. We'd never spoken to them, and we didn't know which teams we should speak to first. We did know that the usual suspects, the normal impediments that you often see in different companies, uh, weren't a problem. There was one automated release process for all of the teams. There was one value stream. There were minimal change approvals, which is always welcome in government. You didn't have to uh, tick any boxes or get like 35 sign-offs from different people. As uh, Paul mentioned about a bank he worked at a while ago, which made me laugh. Uh, the teams were also cross-functional, so there were no handovers between teams. So. Uh, when I saw Hibri's talk earlier, he was talking about how the ops team was under a separate manager and they had to wait for stuff to go through that team. I thought, oh, you know, I'm really glad I've not had that for a couple of years. I'm going to have that again soon enough, because that is the norm, of course. But those kind of constraints weren't a problem for us. So what was the constraint? There's always a constraint. And we absolutely had no clue. And fortunately for me, this was not my first rodeo when it came to measuring things and knowing things. And uh, I knew that it wouldn't be the thing that we thought it was. So this was kind of late 2014. We wanted a way of trying to consistently introduce continuous delivery. And then uh, Jez Humble and Joanne Maleski and Barry O'Reilly were kind enough to publish the Lean Enterprise book, which really uh, advocated the uh, improvement carter. So that's the direction that we went in. So the improvement carter is by a guy called Mike Rover, who studied the Toyota production system for a number of years. And it's a continuous improvement framework. It basically creates a regular cycle of iterative incremental improvements around the existing practices of your organization. So you don't have to start changing the way that you work. You simply create structures around the ways that you already work to encourage a culture of experimentation. So the four steps in the Carter, I'm going to do this without looking to make sure I know it because it's in my book, I should know this. So you uh, create a vision of success to inspire people, to create a sense of urgency amongst people. You then, oh, I'm really forgetting it, you then uh, analyse your data, your qualitative data, your narratives, your quantitative data, your numbers to understand the progress that you've made so far. You then create uh, an improvement milestone the next thing that you want to aim for, you give it some success criteria, you give it a time horizon, and then you use the Deming cycle, the plan, do, check, act cycle. You plan an experiment, you do it, you check the results, and then you, even, you incorporate it into your baseline if it's successful, you discard it if it's not successful. So the improvement cart is lovely, it's perfectly aligned with con the continuous delivery ethos of small regular changes. I strongly recommend it. And uh, setting a direction for 60 teams in government was uh, easier than you might think. I waited until everyone went to lunch, and then I wrote a thing that said, oh, we're going to aim for everyone to deploy every two weeks. And then I published it and felt really, really smart. And now in hindsight, I realized that was a really stupid thing to do because it didn't inspire anyone. They were at lunch, and it wasn't urgent. Everyone was at lunch. Uh, so that didn't really work, I don't think. But we refined it over time, and uh, a while later, we published a thing that showed that when you deployed earlier, defects would go down and you deliver value faster. We backed up with some data and that got a lot more traction. So 
creating a direction is pretty easy. I mean, you shouldn't do it the way I did it. You should have some kind of business urgency behind it. But the harder bit comes after that. Whether you have one team or 60, how do you know if you should focus on stability or speed next? How do you know what your next improvement milestone should be? If you're currently deploying every six months, should you aim for one month or one day or three months? Uh, and then once you've decided upon that, you then get to the point that here we may like, what, what's the next thing you do? What's the next improvement? Which technology or organizational change do you try to work towards that milestone? <coughs> so with one team, that's quite hard. With 60 teams, that's even harder. How do you even know which of your 60 teams to help first? Do you help the team in London that you go to lunch with, that you're friends with? Do you help the team in Lincoln that's been screaming for help for weeks on end? Do you help the team in Aberdeen that you've never heard of that are just working in a cupboard and are a bit lonely? Like you don't have any clue and there's no point pretending that you know, right? So the, the answer is that you're part of a complex, ever-changing system in which you and everyone else has a limited amount of information. And if you're going to make better decisions, you need to reduce uncertainty. And that's where measuring stuff comes in. But what should you measure and uh, how should you do it? Well, luckily for us, uh, Jez, Humble, and the Cold Force women and friends have done, uh, had done some of the groundwork for us. Uh, over the past few years, they've been publishing their annual State of DevOps report, which is like a worldwide survey of IT practitioners. And they've also done some peer-reviewed academic research recently into continuous delivery, which I strongly recommend. So the State of DevOps reports have been really nice. They're very accessible to people. They're easy just to pick up and kind of thumb through and at a glance understand that continuous delivery is a very good thing. I think uh, two years ago especially, they found that uh, organizations that were high performing, that deployed to production very frequently, were twice as likely to exceed market share, productivity, profitability. That's a very nice soundbite that you can take to people and it's backed up by some data. But it's their peer-reviewed research that has been very good because that is less open to challenge, I think. And they've shown that when you adopt continuous delivery over a sustained period of time, then throughput and stability will improve together. They've proven what a lot of people have long suspected, that uh, the choice between features and stability is not a zero-sum game, and that effectively every large consultancy you've ever heard of has been lying to all of us for many, many years. <laughs> Not my consultancy, my consultancy is lovely and small and fluffy. But uh, the large consultancies are dirty, dirty liars. And uh, yes, I'm saying that on film, uh, because there's peer-reviewed research that shows that I'm right. If only I actually used the word liar, not me, never mind. So uh, that's all well and good, but how did that help us understand how to measure stuff in government? Well, what's good is that Jez and Nicole have always used the same measures to quantify stability and throughput. Who here has actually read a State of DevOps report or even gone even further and read the research? Yes, a few of us, we're friends, that's good, that's good. If you haven't now, I can look really smart as if I thought of all of this. Uh, I didn't, I just took what they did and built on it, <coughs> as we all do, I think. So Jez and Nicole have always quantified stability with change failure rate and failure recovery time. So that's how often a change goes wrong and how long it takes to remediate a change that hasn't worked. And they've quantified throughput using change lead time and change frequency. So how long it takes to actually make a change and how often you make changes. So these are measures. These are quantifications of a thing, an object or an event, at a single point in time. But when we perform those measurements over a sustained period of time, at regular periods of time, then they become metrics. And I thought quite a long time ago now, we could create an indicator here, or more than one indicator. We could weave these metrics together by applying the same temporality to them. We could say, for example, I want to look at change, uh, lead time and change interval once every six months for a month and then see how those two metrics relate to one another and it's the interactions between them that are very interesting because that's where you see trends and problems emerging in a domain. Okay, so the first thing we did was the obvious thing to do. We applied the measures to uh, production deployments, which gave us a deployment stability indicator and a deployment throughput indicator. So each time uh, our release tool was used to do something in production, it persisted a snippet of data to a database. 
and uh, that database is very exciting to me because that's the gold mine I spoke about at the very start. If you are not storing metadata on deployments today, start doing it tomorrow because whether you decide to do this stuff tomorrow or a year from now, you're going to want that data. It is a, it is a gold mine. Okay? All you need is like your application name, application version, what you did, when you started doing it and when you finished doing it. That's all you need. Okay? And over time you just build up all this useful data. So we built an indicator service with a couple of scripts uh, and it collected deployment data and it exposed it over JSON and CSV. The CSV was so that we could chuck it into a spreadsheet as a prototype so that we could give people a proof of concept. And once people realized that this was a good thing, we then used uh, the JSON as the real deal and we generated uh, loads of different graphs and put them into like an internal website so all of the teams could see the indicators for themselves. We did all of this with some disk, some scripts, and some charts. There were no new tools. Uh, anyone who's seen me speak before or knows me uh, knows how uh, tool agnostic I am, tools sicken me normally. Uh, I saw someone on Twitter the other day saying, you know, oh, Lambda's really hard, we should use Docker to simplify Lambda, and I had to like go for a walk around my house <laughs> and, like, hum and hum to myself for a while, not answer. I was just like, what are you doing? You know, like, yes, this isn't complicated enough for me anymore. Stop it. Anyway, so, yes, a couple of scripts, right, and a database of data, that's all you need, okay? And on my training courses, that's what I emphasize to people. Like, I don't care which tools you use. Whatever tools you're currently <laughs> using, you can carry on using. Write a couple of scripts and start learning how fast you are currently going and how often things break. Okay, so our deployment stability indicator was composed of deployment uh, failure rate and deployment failure recovery time. And the deployment throughput indicator was composed of deployment lead time and deployment interval. And uh, in the, with the exception of failure rate, we measured uh, average and variation for each of these. That's something that uh, we kind of built on top of Jez and Nicole's stuff. Because the average and variance is very useful, we can then find out if improvements or regressions are consistent and predictable and stable, or if they're just a flash in the pan. So here is the deployment stability indicator we used. So deployment failure rate was the percentage of production deployments that caused failures. Deployment failure recovery time was the median and standard deviation in time between all production failures. Uh, one quirk was uh, we planned to collect failure data by uh, collecting it from the issue tracking system. Uh, since I'm tool agnostic, I shouldn't moan about it, but it's never fun to jeer at something. Uh, two people got that. Okay, it's Jira. Jira sucks, all right? So, uh, the also, to be fair to Jira, the, uh, uh, the data just wasn't rich enough from it. So, uh, I had the idea of us uh, using hotfix deployments as a proxy measure of failures. The idea being that if you are doing a hotfix, something has been broken. So, we calculated the percentage of hotfix deployments to represent the percentage of failed deployments. Uh, deployment failure recovery time was much easier. It's just, you know, look at the time between deployments. So, uh, who wants to see some real numbers? So, we found that across the 60 teams, that was a very interesting range of numbers. Uh, uh, Dan North once said to me, uh, if you do a value stream mapping or any kind of measurements and you don't slap yourself in the face afterwards, then, then your measurements are wrong. And it's definitely true. Uh, so we found that some, at least one team never had any production failures, which was super, uh, whereas some teams were, had failures as often as one in three production deployments. And in terms of deployment failure recovery time, we found that some teams could respond to a failure in under a day, whereas some teams, or at least one team to be fair, took up to 15 days. So that's over a fortnight. That's a long time to be like, <laughs> something's wrong in production. Haven't quite found it yet. You know, we'll keep looking. Uh, oh, we found it now, but we'll take our time. It's fine. Uh, so that was a bit of a wake-up call. Uh, we wanted to do stability first because I have many bugbears, and one is this idea that continuous delivery is just about speed. Like you've got to fix your stability before you start trying to go faster. Otherwise, you're going to get into pain quicker. But it'll still just be pain. And uh, this helped us, right? Because we have 60 different teams, that's 60 different stories. There's only one of me, 
I don't scale despite my best efforts. There's only a, a finite number of people in my team. You can't talk to all 60 teams, right? So straight away we know we want to talk to the team at zero to learn from them and to amplify their success, to help other teams learn from how they achieve success. And at the same time, we know immediately we want to go and see if we can help the teams that are having a lot of production failures and, well, I say a lot, one in three may not be a lot to them, it looks like a lot of paper. Uh, and we also want to see if we can help the teams that are spending up to a fortnight trying to fix something in production. Okay, so we have some teams in continuous delivery, some teams in discontinuous delivery, and this indicator is helping us pinpoint where we need to go to have the right conversations. Okay, so it's not about using numbers to tell stories, that's something called a ludic fallacy. Uh, it's about using your indicators to go and find out where the stories that need to be told are. Okay? And it's those narratives that will help you understand how to grow continuous delivery. Okay? If you try to govern things just by numbers, you'll end up in a lot of trouble. Okay, so here's our first example. Uh, this is the deployment stability indicator for a team we'll call Apples. Uh, the x-axis here is time. Uh, the y-axis are the units of measurement. On the left, it's deployment failure rate as a percentage. On the right, it's deployment failure recovery time in days. That doesn't really matter. What matters is the dark red line is the median uh, failure recovery time and the dark blue line is uh, deployment failure rate. So is Team Apple's getting into trouble or are they getting better? Thank you. Yes, they are trending towards continuous delivery. Going down is good. Okay. Uh, somebody once pointed out to me that you say you want high throughput, Steve, but that means getting numbers down, which is confusing. But I try not to think about that too hard. It hurts my head. But yes, this team was doing some very good things. Uh, in the six month period, they went from having two in three production deployments end up as failures into none being failures. And they went from taking, uh, let's see, was it uh, two days to fix something in production to going to no days to having to fix this. And when we looked at deployment throughput for this team as well, we found out that they had also improved in throughput. Instead of deploying to production once every four days, they were doing it once every day at least. So just as uh, Jez and Nicole have proven that throughput and stability improve together when you get continuous delivery right, this team was doing it. And they didn't actually know they were doing it. We went and showed them these graphs and they were like, of course, Steve, you know, we're awesome. But they didn't know how good they were. And we got to go back and talk through the situation with them and ask how did you get better, what happened in these time periods, and the things that they told us about their automated acceptance testing, about them improving their production monitoring. We could share those lessons with other teams. I actually heard from them today. A team popped up saying how do we do a production deployment at midnight? And uh, their tech lead popped up in my team's channel and said oh just do a time-based feature toggle, here's our code. And I was like, yeah, that's a great idea, a time-based feature toggle. You can do that. And I need to find out how that works. Like, that was awesome. So uh, yes, Apple's are going along doing very well. Although unfortunately now they know that they're good and uh, that they're enjoying it a bit too much, I think. Uh, okay, so, uh, <laughs> so this is uh, the deployment throughput indicator. So here, deployment lead time is the time between creating a release artifact and deploying into production. Deployment interval uh, was the median and standard deviation of time between production deployments. Okay, so we had all the deployment data we needed for this. And you'll notice that these measures are nothing to do with the technology value stream in this government department. You could do this all yourself. These measures are universal, I think. Anyway, let's get to the data. So we found out, <laughs> it was even more surprising, we found out that teams were taken between 1 and 26 days to go from creating an artifact to going into production. And when you don't have uh, silo teams, when you don't have mandatory end-to-end -end testing, when you don't have manual releases, that's pretty amazing in 26 days. Like, what are you doing? You're going on holiday? And also the frequency was between 1 and 58 days. That, that is a holiday, right? You've got to be on holiday if it's 58 days between production deployments. When you have other teams going every day, when those kind of usual constraints aren't in place, that was a real surprise. And uh, again, it's a way of showing us which teams we should speak to, which teams we need to learn from, which teams we can help. So this is the deployment throughput indicator for the Bananas team. So this team was doing well, but they had some challenges. The dark orange line, the dark green line there, the average 
lead time and the average interval, and you'll see that they are both pretty good at the start. They're both below uh, eight days, but then in this six month period, they start to go in the wrong direction. We had no clue what the problem was, and we didn't guess. We simply went along and said, hello, uh, our data seems to suggest that you're having some troubles at the moment. Is there anything we can help with? And they had had a number of departures from the team. A bunch of developers had left the team on short notice. And they had a, 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 some new team members that were still getting to grips with the digital service, getting to grips with government. And they were still trying to retain the original cadence because the outgoing team had said, oh yeah, we deploy every three days. And they wanted to do the same. But that's not how it works, right? If you're new to something, you need to slow down a bit before you go fast again. So uh, we did a value stream mapping with the team, which is something I always recommend. And we found out that their constraint was the integration testing environment. It turned out that the new team members didn't know that it was optional. So that was easily fixed. We said, it's optional. And I wheeled out someone from a cupboard to say, yes, it is optional. And then I put them back into the cupboard. Uh, you need that person. That person's very important. Uh, that's not a real person. There's not a person the government will keep in a cupboard. That would be really wrong. Uh, so, oh, damn it, okay, god damn it, there's no one in the cupboard. Right, so, uh, this, was a little, this was a little different, right? This was a very unusual constraint. We didn't expect this, right? We thought it would be something elaborate and crazy, not just a bunch of people left, and now we're new and we don't quite know how to get to grips with stuff. So we kind of sat down and said, how can we help? Here's another team that's got a similar digital service to you. They're another part of the country, but they'll help you. Just chat to them online. And we asked them to look at their monitoring, and generally we just said, we're here to help, and we left them alone. And over time, they started to improve again, which was really good. We often did value stream mappings with teams to uh, help understand where they were losing time, where the waste was accruing in their value stream. And we, kept, we had some very unusual things come up, and team members departing was uh, often one of them, actually. It was very interesting. Okay, so let's talk about build indicators. So I found that Jez and Nicole's original measures of stability and throughput can be reapplied to different aspects of the technology value stream. You don't have to just use them for deployments. So in their research, they've found that continuous integration is a statistically significant predictor of continuous delivery, which shouldn't be a surprise to anyone in this community. And it's kind of common sense after a while, I think. If you build things frequently, it's possible to deliver things frequently. One without the other would be quite interesting to watch from a distance, a safe distance. Uh, so what we can do though is we can take these indicators and just apply them into, into builds. We can look at a build stability indicator composed of build failure rate and build failure recovery time. We can look at build throughput composed of build lead time and build interval. And all we had to do for this was to update our indicator service to scrape information out of the artifact repository and out of the version control system. And again, we looked at median and standard deviation. So for the build stability indicator, build failure rate was the percentage of builds that failed. And build failure recovery time was the median and standard deviation of time to recover from a build failure. And uh, the numbers were uh, horrific. We found some teams uh, never had build failures, whereas uh, at least one team took 41% uh, uh, of their builds fail. And uh, recovery times vary between uh, zero hours and uh, 12 days. So which is pretty special, you know, you leave the build broken for 12 days, I'm not, not quite sure what's going on. But that was another interesting thing that we need to learn from to understand if it's something in the tool chain that we can resolve, since my team owned release engineering. If it's something in the team, in the team's culture that we can try to help with or help them learn from another team around them. So uh, our example of build stability is the Grapes team, which was uh, very puzzling at the time. So uh, here, the dark purple line is their build failure rate, which you'll notice is very low, which is good. It was around 1% or, or for this whole six months. But the average build failure recovery time is high. It was over 12 uh, hours. And there's very low variation. So that doesn't feel quite right. Something doesn't fail very often, but when it does, it takes ages to fix and always the same amount of time or thereabouts. In my experience, if something infrequently fails, it's very hard to predict how long it would take to resolve. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So we spoke with the team and uh, they quite openly told us the truth, which kind of uh, surprised us, which was that uh, their acceptance test took over 10 hours to run. They didn't know that there was a team like mine available somewhere in the country to help them. 
And when they were under pressure to deliver to a certain date, they created the artifact first and then ran the acceptance test later on a schedule. And if they failed, they went back and fixed it and cut another build. And so when they did run the tests in advance and they broke, they then took 10 hours to fix, which explained the data. We would never have figured that out just by staring at some numbers. We just had an open and honest conversation with them. We helped them understand they were carrying a risk a bit further into their value stream than they uh, should do. And we stole someone from another team to help them get down their acceptance test run. Uh, that person helped them convert their UI acceptance tests into API acceptance tests and unit tests. It, it, they helped them uh, get their tests to run in parallel. And gradually that time came down and down and down until they always ran them before a release like everyone else. And in the future when other teams had problems with acceptance tests and said, this can't be fixed, we could point them at that and say, that's what the Grapes team used to be like. And now they're much improved. So we know it can be done and you can talk to that team and they'll help you out. Okay, so for build throughput, build lead time was the time between uh, creating an artifact, excuse me, between committing a change to master and uh, creating an artifact. And uh, build interval was the time between creating uh, build artifacts. And uh, the time on this was also uh, alarming. Uh, some teams needed zero hours to build an artifact from master. Other teams needed 14 hours to build from master. And uh, for at least one team, the build frequency uh, was every 15 hours. You know, that's pretty good. Uh, especially when you think we're talking about calendar days, where they're building things at weekends. You know, that's pretty good. Uh, but in the case of at least one team, it was uh, 47 days between builds. And yes, the Apple's team I mentioned earlier that were doing very, very well were building very, very fast. And the grapes team I mentioned that had a few problems, they were not building very frequently. Okay, so that strong correlation between continuous integration and continuous delivery, it's not just in research, it's out there in practice, and I've certainly seen it. So uh, this is the build throughput indicator for the Oranges team. The really interesting thing here is the dark red line, which is their average build interval. So you can see that they got very good. They went from building once every, one, every four days down to once to build, one, building once a day. But then soon after that, they went back to building once every four days. Would anybody like to guess what happened? Why did they get better and then regress? Somebody left the company. Nice try. I thought that at the time. I thought there was someone like me making them build faster, or like Hibri, and then the moment that that person leaves, People stop doing it because you're just getting compliance, not commitment. No, the, they had a business event. So what happened was that spring there was a big deal and people crunched to hit the deadline and stuff got built much more often. And their lead time stayed low. They could build it in less than an hour. They just didn't have that much motivation to do it until someone said, you must do this. And then when the business event ended, they started to creep back to the way things used to be that worked for them locally, they thought. So again, we helped them improve their acceptance tests. We did uh, a value stream mapping, just looking at their builds, found they had some issues around UI acceptance tests, surprise, surprise. But crucially with this team, they never said this can't be too hard or we can't do it because we showed them. We said, look, you've done it. You could build once a day. You were building, let's get you down to building once a day, then talk about once every few hours, right? But you've made that massive improvement in one month, so you can do it again. And this time no one's saying you must do it. You know, it's something that we know you can do. Okay, so finally, uh, after that, I decided to go even further and uh, apply our throughput indicators to code as well. So for years, continuous delivery practitioners have found that individuals committing code to master at least once a day makes continuous integration much easier. So continuous integration is a practice in which every member of a team commits to master at least once a day. So it stands to reason then that individuals have to be doing it at least once a day, I think. And trunk-based development is still considered, you know, this awful heresy. Uh, 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 Jez Humble always says it's the most controversial practice still that he advocates. Uh, Paul Hammond, one of the godfathers of trunk-based development, just launched a website called trunkbaseddevelopment.com that has loads of good resources on trunk-based development. I, I recommend it. I added some publications to it. He wanted me to work on it, but I couldn't find the time. But uh, I don't think trunk-based development is a heresy. I think it's just hard. I think it's another one of these things that people like me kind of stroll around and say, you know, you should be doing this. And you, but you kind of forget how hard it was to get started, just like, just like uh, test-driven development, just like continuous integration and the like. 
but I thought it would be interesting to uh, look at the mainline commit lead time, the time from committing to a branch to merging into master, and the mainline commit interval, uh, the frequency in which you're merging into master. So we already had the data we needed because we were already scraping the data out of our build system. Yes, so mainline commit lead time from branch to master, mainline commit interval between master, and if you're doing trunk-based development, you get a zero, which is awesome because you're straight to mainline. And we found some, very, by this point, the data wasn't surprising me quite so much. We found that teams spent between zero and 29 hours between uh, putting something on a branch and it being merged to master. And uh, at least one team was doing it in five hours, you know, uh, pushing stuff to master every five hours, you know, that's pretty good. And then, yes, there was uh, one team where it was uh, 31 days between uh, commits to master. So uh, I uh, was the person who kind of advocated GitHub Flow as the branching strategy for all of the teams. As Hibri mentioned earlier, it's a stepping stone towards trunk-based development. Clearly, there was at least one team out there that probably didn't know that that's what was uh, intended. So yes, uh, we have a, a final example, which was the pairs team. Uh, uh, you'll never look at a pair again the same way after this. So pairs. So uh, this team, uh, they wanted uh, the central build server to build branches. Uh, I'm going to speak carefully now because I'm being filmed and because I'm a nice person. So they, the team were, they believed very strongly that building branches would speed up their build frequency. That is a fair statement. And it would be fair to say that my team, I, uh, politely declined on the grounds that continuous delivery and our experience of other teams taught us that you didn't need that. When you have 60 teams, not just one, and one team says, can I be different to the other 59? It's very easy to say, why don't the other 59 teams need that? And in some cases, it is a legitimate need. One team might say, I need this guy pink, and you say, well, we've never done that before. And then they say, well, I've got a ministerial commitment, and you say, well, show it to me. And they go, I've got a letter from the chancellor, like, congratulations, we will paint the sky pink for you. <coughs> but other times, they go, I want the sky pink just because it looks nice. Like, well, we don't need to do that, right? The sky's blue, it's fine. Unless the chancellor phones up. So, uh, well, whoever, I don't know, someone in government, I made that up. So, uh, he doesn't phone up. So, uh, yes, this team, they wanted their branches built for them and then they were sad or dejected, if you prefer, when uh, it didn't happen. And we looked at their code throughput. So the dark blue line here shows their mainline commit lead time from uh, branch to master. That line is at the bottom. It looks very low. That's because the y-axis is enormous. It wasn't actually that low. Let's see. They went from, they declined from uh, zero to 34 hours between branch and master. And you can see that dark purple line. That's the frequency of commits to master that regressed from, let's see, uh, every four days to every 27 days. So that's, yeah, the y-axis is measured in hours. That nearly broke the graph. Uh, we talked about putting in a fix for the pairs team. <laughs> the graphs don't work for pairs. Uh, this team needed help. They didn't need scorn. They didn't need derision. They didn't need me being parachuted in from London saying, <laughs> you should do this. You know, they needed help. And uh, they had a good reason for doing what they were doing. The reason was that they had been told and they had signed up to make some very sweeping architectural changes to their digital service. But at the same time, they had a lot of business demand. They had to keep turning out new features. And the way that they were trying to satisfy these two uh, problems was with branching. As a lot of us, including me, have done in the past, and that doesn't work. But the problem is, until you've done it and know it doesn't work, you don't know it's not going to work. So we uh, had some chats with them. We talked about them using feature toggles. We connected them with the Apple's team, who were like, you know, you can do feature toggles for this, folks. It will be fine. We had something very similar to this. You know, we utilized the strength of the network we had, the different teams, and they did improve. And now, I think today, I saw their team lead popping up and like advising another team on not avoiding branches. That would be like a really happy ending that made me seem really, really cool. He didn't, didn't say that. He was helping with something else. But I was like, well, it's really cool that he's actually getting out there now and helping other teams. And uh, the feature toggles that they put in actually had an operational benefit because one of those large consultancies I have such a distaste for, uh, they were late shipping an API. It was very, very late in the day. People got very, very excited. And then the pairs team, bless them, just went, 
we'll just turn off our support for it. We can do that in two minutes with a toggle. It'll be fine. We've got some hard coded data. It'll work. Here are the tests. So feature toggles have a benefit beyond escaping branching. They have a real operability benefit. Okay, and this team demonstrated it for us, which was wonderful. Okay, so uh, I've taken, uh, let's see, 15 minutes longer than I meant to. I'm sorry about that. It was the moaning at the start, I think. Uh, so I've shared with you uh, the indicators and some stories from two and a half years and 60 teams uh, where there's been some real traction uh, on continuous delivery. Measuring continuous delivery didn't tell us what to do but it did tell us where to go and find out what to do. And it was often different for different teams. Okay? But whether you have one team, a few teams in your bank startup, whether you have 60 teams or 7 teams, this is enormously powerful because the combination of the indicators, that's your quantified data, and the conversations you have, the qualitative data, that will give you some really powerful insights into how you should be adopting continuous delivery in your organization. Okay, so thanks very much. That's the book on LeanPub, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.